It's happened again. It's happened again. <clears throat> Bad way to start a video. I know, I'm sorry, but it's happened again. You know who I'm talking about. Hi, I'm Adrian, and welcome to UCL This Week. Let's jump in and talk about these matches. Let's talk about the semi-finalists a little bit. We know who's in the semi-finals. And we'll start with Tuesday's matches. Masters of their own demise, they've crumbled again. Just last week, I spoke of how Barcelona's of the past would have crumbled in Paris during last week's match. This Barcelona crumbled in Barcelona at Montjuic. The first 10 minutes or so of this match saw Barcelona hardly get out of their own half, with PSG testing Barca's back line, trying to find their way through, and looking dangerous. Barcola starting ahead of Asensio, great. But then just like that, Lamin Yamal conjured up some magic in a wide position, whipped the ball across goal, and it bounced in off of Rafinha's knee. Not so sure what Hakimi was doing there defensively, but take nothing away from the quality of Yamal there, both for the run and the ball into the six. Speaking of Barcola, by the way, he actually had a huge role in this in that he saw Nesta Araujo get sent off, running in behind. Araujo had to catch up to him. He put an arm on his shoulder to pull him back. Didn't pull too hard, to be honest with you, but Barcola goes down, red card for Araujo. Now, it's one of those red cards where if it was my team and I was biased, I would hate to see it. It's one of those you hate to see it red cards, but when you put your hand where it shouldn't be, then you are forcing the referee into making a decision about whether or not it's a foul. And when you're the last man and you're denying a goal scoring opportunity, then there can only be one outcome, a red. When we think of a red card, we often think of a violent outburst or a horror tackle. That's sort of the bar, right? So these last man reds can feel like a robbery due to the lack <laughs> of violence, but it was for sure technically the correct call from the referee. Now there are some pundits that I only listen to in specific situations. For example, Michael Owen. Generally when Michael Owen speaks, we sleep. However, when he speaks from the point of view of a striker analyzing their decision-making and the runs they could make, I listen. Similarly, when Rio Ferdinand speaks about defenders in decision-making, I listen. He pointed out that in this moment, Araujo had a decision. Sprint back in a straight line and try to cut off the angle of the attacker and force him into taking you on one-on-one, -on -one, or go for the attacker and the ball straight away but you'll then be in a foot race, should they cut inside. He chose the latter option, he knew he chose wrong after that touch across him, and he gave him a pull on the shoulder out of desperation. Wrong choice, Barca pay dearly. And even Ilkay Gundogan after the match spoke of how you have to be absolutely sure when going for the ball in these moments, and he would rather concede a goal or let their keeper, Ter Stegen, have a chance at saving it than go down a man. He didn't pull any punches when speaking of Cancelo as well. We'll get to Cancelo in a second. But anyway, shortly after the red card, who else but Dembele to make it 1-1 on the night with another goal against Barcelona. In the second half, about 10 minutes into it, a corner kick for PSG is played to Vitinha at the edge of the box, and he had enough time to WhatsApp his mom, check how his investments are doing, and finally strike the ball at goal. Lewandowski with a half-assed attempt at closing him down, you could say the same of De Jong, and Ter Stegen with not much of a chance to save what was a really well-hit ball. After that, Barcelona's lack of concentration continued as Cancelo went diving in on Usman Dembele for absolutely no reason, giving away a penalty. Really, really silly from Cancelo. No reason to go to ground there when Dembele is in that position in particular, not even heading toward goal really. And it's a cheap penalty to give away. Just shadow him. You know what he's going to do. It's not like he's going to hit it at goal there. He's probably going to go to the byline and cross. Anyway, a really cheap penalty and goal to give away because Mbappe conferred it. Again, Gundogan's disappointment was clear when he reflected on these decisions, not faulting the ref, as some Barca supporters have, but faulting the decisions of his own teammates. The one thing they can control, they failed to do so. Now, not long after Gundogan thought that he should have had a penalty, though for me, he was fishing for it. At least that's what I thought on the first few viewings. It seemed like he had no chance at getting the ball as Marquinhos stepped in front of him, so he dangled his back leg out, got the contact he wanted, and went down. I still feel that way a bit, especially since Marquinhos had the ball covered and would have just ushered it out, but after viewing it a few more times, it's the kind of contact, that little clip, that is basically a flip of the coin as to whether it will be given or not. Depending on the referee, it can go in either direction, some give it, some don't, which is kind of confusing actually that this ref in particular didn't give it based simply on how cutthroat he was in the rest of this match. 
of which neither the ref nor VAR went for it. And I was okay with that call. The fact that Gundogan didn't speak much about it speaks volumes. But I say that Barca are masters of their own device because they made some massive, massive mistakes in this. The red card, putting zero pressure on Vitinha for his goal, and then Cancelo's diving in on Dembele when he had absolutely zero reason to do so. Even in things like the 88th minute, for example, Lewandowski is attacking with teammates to his right and left, Strong Felix to his left, and yet he elects to take it himself and Marquinhos blocks it. What happens directly after that? PSG attack in the other direction, and Mbappe scores to take the tie beyond Barcelona and make it 6-4 on aggregate. They did it to themselves, but you can't take anything away from PSG, who, where they were wasteful in the first leg, they made the most of each and every opportunity that they had in this match, both the ones that they created themselves and the ones that Barcelona handed to them on a platter. Where they were bottlers in the past, they were cool and in control in this one, while Barcelona were the ones who can feel upset with themselves for how they were their own worst enemies. I mean, even Xavi losing his cool and getting himself sent to the stands. You don't need that, man. Your team doesn't need that. They need you on the touchline. Unfortunate in some ways for Barcelona is that initial red card sort of started a chain of silly mistakes for them. And it was always going to be difficult against a team like PSG who have quality all over the pitch. But Barca were in the driver's seat and they drove the car straight off of the road. So who would PSG be facing in the semis? Borussia Dortmund versus Atletico in Germany. Then Borussia Dortmund pretty much picked up from where they left off in the second half in Madrid. Remember how they were swarming at Letty? You had Bino Gittens hitting the bar, then Brandt hitting the bar at the very end of the match, last kick of the game. Well, Borussia Dortmund were brilliant in that first half, and with the yellow wall and the rest of the 80,000 plus supporters pushing them on against Simeone's men, they looked really strong. But two things were true in that first half, I think it's fair to say. Borussia Dortmund were very good, and Atletico Madrid very bad. And when that happens, you have an unhappy situation for Mr. Diego Simeone. <laughs> well, to be fair, Atleti did have one solid opportunity in that first half that Cobell saved, but other than that, they were quite poor. Borussia Dortmund, on the other hand, also had a couple of chances to go ahead, but two of their less dangerous opportunities were the ones that found the back of the net. Brand from an odd angle, of which Oblak just got a piece of it, but it still snuck under the bar, should have done better. Then Matson from a similar angle on the same side, and he beat Oblak as well. Oblak, what's up, man? What's going on? So things were looking fantastic for Borussia Dortmund, but the pendulum fully swung in the other direction in the second half. And while Atleti definitely needed a favor from Hummels, they were playing much better in the second half. Said favor was a completely innocuous header from a corner that wasn't very dangerous at all, but Hummels touch took it past Gregor Kobel. Cheesy goal, but Atleti needed that to get back into the game, and their play was deserving of it at that point. That continued with Angel Correa finishing off a scrambly, multi-attempt moment for Atleti, <laughs> putting them back in the driver's seat. But Dortmund woke up again with that left side of Dortmund once again proving the dangerous side for Dortmund, and that side of defense suffering for Atleti. Where Dortmund scored two goals in five minutes in the first half, they bettered that in the second with two goals in two minutes. The first, a brilliant cross from Sabitzer that Fulkrug just guided in, stunning glancing header in off of the post, love that. Then we saw Fulkrug set up Sabitzer, whose low strike made it through Oblak. Honestly though, Oblak, again, I thought he would have saved that one, maybe in a different season. Those two goals put Dortmund back ahead on aggregate, 4-2 on the night, 5-4 on aggregate, and they, are moving on. This is massive from Borussia Dortmund, who are struggling to solidify their place in the top four of the Bundesliga, but they are through to the semifinals of the Champions League, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but their entire season hasn't. And that's why the Champions League knockout rounds are fun. They are completely unpredictable at times. They can be. They, not, they aren't always, but they can be. But Borussia Dortmund deserved it. In fact, they probably deserved more from the match in Madrid, but they more than made up for it at home against Atletico. Following Angel Correa's goal, Borussia Dortmund increased the intensity to a level that even a Simeone side couldn't handle, as Atleti didn't have a single shot after that goal. It's typically the Atleti sides that are running themselves into the ground, outworking the opposition even when they aren't at the level they want to be technically, but it was Dortmund who had both the work ethic and the technical ability. Their third and fourth goals were absolute beauties, namely that glancing header from Full Krug. I'll keep talking about that one. It's special. So, Borussia Dortmund move on and will face PSG in the semifinals of the Champions League. 
They are very much familiar with each other at this point, considering they shared a group of which Dortmund topped the group, tying 1-1 in Dortmund and PSG winning 2-0 in Paris. That's enough backstory though. I'll save that for the preview video. In the Champions League, you've got to act like you've been there before, you know? That's the phrase for this matchup, as Arsenal failed to do so while Bayern looked the part. Arsenal will be completely disappointed with how they played, not just at the Emirates, but in the second leg as well. They never really looked dangerous in this, did they? Bayern hosting Arsenal, and just like the other match on the night, it was all to play for. Winner takes all in this one, and it was Bayern that had the first real opportunity. About three minutes in, when a ball across the cane was met by the English striker, but it just bounced wide. From there, however, the chances of note were mostly of the Arsenal persuasion in that first half as Martinelli started to cause some issues for Bayern's right side of defense. However, Martinelli will also be very angry with himself in that he fluffed his lines in the 30th minute. Great attacking movement from Arsenal, squared to Martinelli around the penalty spot, and he hit a weak, weak, feeble attempt straight at Manuel Neuer. In all, not much to talk about in that first half as far as massive opportunities go in either direction. A few balls that went through the box for each side, a couple of relatively tame efforts, nothing really more. In the second, however, like literally one minute in, hit the crossbar with a beautiful header, they hit the woodwork again, and then they were all over Arsenal in that second half, and they were rewarded for their positivity shortly after. A cross from Sané was palmed away by Raya, but Guerrero found Kimmich making a run from deep, and he had a relatively free header thanks to Martinelli, giving up on marking him, really. 1-0 on the night, 3-2 on aggregate for Bayern at that point. From there, Arsenal had a couple of moments in the second half where they looked like they could potentially find an equalizer. Potentially. They flirted with the idea of maybe doing it. <laughs> but they were either offside, like in Gabriel Jesus' case, or had their effort blocked, such as Martin Odegaard had. In fact, he should have had a corner there, but the referee got it completely wrong. But for every Arsenal attack, there was one or two Bayern attacks in the opposite direction that looked just as dangerous. Jamal Musiala was causing issues, Kane as well. It just felt like this match was out of reach for Arsenal, like they never really had it in them to overcome Bayern. Could be the inexperience, which we saw through Saka's terrible final kick of the match for Arsenal. It could have been the intimidating history getting to them and playing in a real football atmosphere. <laughs> at the Allianz Arena. Also a credit to Bayern defensively and a man who is so often memed in Eric Dyer. He was very, very good for Bayern today, deserving of high praise. And as Squawka has pointed out, he has now reached as many Champions League semifinals as Arsenal has as a club. That said, I really do feel that Arsenal lost this tie overall when playing at home. Giving up those two goals from Bayern at the Emirates was a bit of a death blow because as you will remember from last week's video, their away form is pretty shit in the Champions League. One win in all of the matches they played away, that being against Sevilla, the 13th place team in La Liga. Their domestic campaigns are going in opposite directions. Arsenal still have the Premier League to play for, to fight for, while Bayern move on to the semifinals of the Champions League despite being 16 points adrift in the Bundesliga, already surrender their title. Still a chance at silverware for each of these sides though. And Bayern would move on to face who? Well, you could tell early doors that Real Madrid had learned their lessons from last season's match in Manchester that they lost 4-0. This time around, they played very, very deep, surrendering the ball to Manchester City and hoping to hit them on the break. I guess not too dissimilar from the first leg, really, but even deeper in this game. Two things that were different, however, were both Walker and De Bruyne starting this match, as well as Ederson, so I guess three things. And De Bruyne in particular was a problem down that right side for Man City. A few times he got in behind Real Madrid's back line and sent a whipped ball into the box. Both times they were dealt with by Real Madrid's defense and Lunin in that first half. But he also was keen to strike from outside of the box to test Lunin on a few occasions in that first half. On his left as well, one Lunin save, one over the bar, etc. But it was big game Rodrigo who put Real Madrid ahead, of course. This man always shows up in the difficult matches in the Champions League for Real Madrid, and he did so again. However, while he won't get an assist, a massive credit to Bellingham for keeping the attack going for Real Madrid with an incredible touch. Sexy, sexy touch. Vinicius threw, and he squared to Rodrigo. With Walker slipping on his ass, Rodrigo had two bites at it, finished off the second. 1-0 Real Madrid. They took the lead on aggregate. From there, City turned up the heat some more and continued to push, but couldn't find a goal in that first half. 
In the second half, City turned it up to another level, and through Nacho, they almost had a goal. <laughs> Ball played through to Holland. Nacho was shielding it, then touched it around his own keeper, Lunin, nearly into his own goal, but he did recover with Holland at his back. It was pretty mad to watch. One thing I found when it came to City was that their attacks down the left would lose momentum with Grealish out there. They would just fizzle out. Personally, I would have switched him out for Doku. I mean, I would have started Doku ahead of him, but I would have switched him out earlier in the half for someone who's a bit more direct, who will run at Carvajal rather than stand on his tippy toes and shimmy along the touchline. That felt like a missed opportunity not having Doku out there earlier, but Guardiola rectified that when he brought him on in the 70th minute. And wouldn't you know it, after a couple of failed attempts to beat Carvajal, Doku took it to the byline against Valverde, cut it across, Rudiger blocked the cross because of course he blocks everything, but KDB was there to roof it past Lunin right over his head, 1-1, back level on aggregate. In extra time, City continued to dominate with Real Madrid offering almost nothing, but that said, the best opportunity probably fell to Rudiger and he put it over. <laughs> that would have been so typical of football to have that go in, eh? Rudiger of all people, unfortunate for Real Madrid, they probably didn't deserve it. But hey, deserve? Who deserves anything in football, right? So what if you deserve something? Doesn't mean you're going to get it. And despite each side giving their best efforts, City mostly dominating Real Madrid in the entirety of the match, it came down to a penalty shootout. Not what you want to see, really, if you're a supporter of either of these sides, but for a neutral like myself, I mean, bring the drama, even if it is a shame for one of these sides to go out like this, right? It does kind of suck, as fun as it is to watch. And here's your penalty shootout recap. You ready for this? Alvarez, goal. Modric, saved by Ederson. Great save, honestly, as it wasn't the worst penalty I've seen. Bernardo, horrible. Maybe the worst penalty I've seen. Down the middle. Maybe all that time waiting around for the ball to come out of the crowd caused him to just hit it like that. I don't know. Bellingham, goal. Kovacic, great save by Lunin. Vasquez, calm, goal. Foden, goal. Nacho, goal. Ederson to take the fifth for City, had to score, and he did. So then he had a chance to save City up against Rudiger. Could he mimic Ricardo for Portugal, but in the opposite order? No. Rudiger hit it perfectly. Real Madrid through. They win the shootout and advance. A brutal outcome for City, the defending champions, who were much, much better than Real Madrid on the day, but just could not find a goal, and goals are what matter. Real Madrid, on the other hand, rode their luck at times, but that Champions League quality came through for them once again. They move on to the semifinals against Bayern Munich. Classic matchup, really. For City, they just lack that final bit of quality around the box, and if you don't kill off Real Madrid when you have the chance, they will kill you. So it's set, Dortmund versus PSG on one side and Bayern versus Real Madrid in the Champions League semifinals on the other. Looking forward to that and looking forward to setting it all up and discussing it with you guys early next week. Thanks as always for watching guys and I'll see you in the next video. Take care.